الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين طيب so we continue in the chapter the pillars of faith beginning on page 22 under the subsection belief in Allah <clears throat> and the compilers they say <clears throat> so before we start actually we said that belief in Allah it had four fundamental components what were those four fundamental components of the, the belief in Allah that's belief, belief in the messengers well belief in the messengers is one of the six articles of faith, but specifically one of the articles of faith, belief in Allah, that article of faith has four fundamental components. Fundamental, that's fundamental. That, um, that there are no um, other books. Well, we're talking about specifically you belief. Just, you just took Shahid last night. MashaAllah, Tabarakallah. What's your name, Akhi? Shaqeel. Shaqeel, nice to meet you, Akhi. Alhamdulillah. Forza Sayyidah. All right, so you guys remember last week we said that believing in Allah has four fundamental components. Give me one. Okay, so one of the fundamental components of believing in Allah is what? Believing in His right to be worshipped alone. Ahsan, that's good. What about the other three? Hmm. Belief in the angels. Tafadhan Omar. Well, belief in the angels is an extension of the belief in Allah, but specifically, if we just focus all of our attention on the belief in Allah, belief in Allah, when you say you believe in Allah, it means you have to believe primarily in what? In four things. Or you have to believe in Allah from four, from four angles, if you will. So four fundamental components. Omar, do you know one? Another one? That would be, that's belief in general, but we're specifically talking about belief in Allah. So when the Prophet said, when he was asked about faith, he says that you believe in Allah and the angels and the books and the messengers, right? So now, that's six things. From those six things, we have belief in Allah. If we focus our attention on the belief in Allah, there were four components. Four components of the belief in Allah. Now you guys remember, I threatened last week. I said, if I ask something and nobody knows the answer, I was going to get up and walk out. I had to the shit. Well, that's the same one you just said. And that was a good one. But that's only one. Okay, let's, let, me, let me give them to you. Ah, sent. Yes. So first and foremost, to believe in life, to believe that He exists. You have to believe in His existence. And after you believe in His existence... Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, so you believe in his existence, believe in his right to be worshipped alone. There's two left. Believe in his what? His lordship. Believe in his what? His lordship. And then you believe in what? The names by which he's called and the attributes by which he's or with which he's described. So, four things. What are the four things? You have to believe in Allah's existence. Then secondly, you have to believe in His Lordship. And we're going to talk about what that means in a, in a few minutes. <coughs> and then after that, you have to believe in the names by which He's called and the attributes by which He's described or with which He's described. And then finally, you have to believe in His right to be worshipped alone. Those are the four fundamental components of what? Believing in Allah. If anybody didn't have any one of those, he wouldn't what? He wouldn't really believe in Allah the way you're supposed to believe in Allah in Islam. Tayyib, so the first section under the heading belief in Allah is going to focus on the second component, which is belief in His Lordship. What is belief in His Lordship? Belief in His Lordship, it means believing in those actions which are specific to Him. The things that He does that no one else can do. 
That's the meaning of believing what in Allah's lordship. That you believe in those actions that he does and only he can do. And you believe that only he can do them. And they're going to mention some of those in this section under the first section of belief in Allah. So it says, belief in Allah is the first of these articles of faith. Allah is the only true God. He is one and has no partners at all. He is the Lord. And now they're going to expand on that. Okay, He's the Lord. What does that mean? The Creator. So Him being the Lord means that he, one of the actions He performs that nobody else can perform is what? Creation. Creation. Creating something from nothing. nothing. That's something that He can do and no one else can do. He's the Sovereign. Means that what? He's what? Above. The King. The one who has the dominion. That's another quality of His, what? his Lordship. That he is the king, he is the governor, he is the ruler, he rules over all creation. Another action of his that no one else does. And the manager of all affairs. Not only does he rule over everything, he what? He conducts everything. And determines what happens and what doesn't happen. Did they say that he's the most powerful? Yeah, it's going to come, I'm sure that's going to come. Definitely going to come. And the manager of all affairs. He is ever eternal and perfect. He did not give birth. Nor was he born. He is the living. And the everlasting. And neither slumber nor sleep seizes him. And those last few. Um, phrases were more related to what? His qualities. His attributes. Than to his lordship. Now they come back to what? His lordship. So they say. To him belongs all that is in the heavens and the earth. He knows the seen and the unseen. So another action that he performs, that nobody else performs, is the act of what? Knowing everything, especially the unseen. The unseen. His knowledge encompasses everything. He is completely knowledgeable about a thing even before he creates it. Knowing the how of the thing and all of its conditions and stipulations, including its duration of existence. So the thing about Allah's knowledge is that His knowledge, not only does He know what He created, okay? But He knows what He created if He had not created it, how would things have been? He also knows about the things that He didn't create. If he created them, how they would what? How they would be. You follow me? So this is his, his knowledge has no what? Has no limitations. And then he says, including, and then he says, he has complete control over everything. And nothing happens except by his permission. Nothing happens except by his permission. permission. So that's all related to what? Arububi. Except a few uh, lines which relate to what his asma was sifat. So let's, let's go back, let's rewind it quickly. Four components to the belief in Allah. What are the four components? Lordship. Belief in His, before His Lordship though, that's right. But before that, existence. His existence. Belief in His existence. Then belief what? His Lordship. Lordship means what? What do we mean by Lordship? The actions that He does that no one else can do. And so we believe that He can only do these things. Then after his lordship comes, his names, his name. by which he's called, attributes, by which he's described, or with which he's described. And then finally, his right to be worshipped alone, or his right to those acts of devotion that we perform, right? His right to what? Those alone. So the next paragraph now is going to go to that third component. And that third component is what? The names by which he's called. And the attributes with which he's described. So it says, He is the first, the last, the highest, the nearest, and the knower of all things. He is ever living without end. He is the wise, the well acquainted. With him are the keys to all knowledge beyond human reach. So there they mention some names of Allah, like Al Awwal. 
Wal Hakim, Wal Latif. These are names of Allah. And they also mention qualities, like for example, He is the ever living, He is the highest, He is the nearest, etc. With Him are the keys to all knowledge beyond human reach. He is the all hearing and all seeing, as Samia al Basir. He is well acquainted with all what his creatures what his creatures do, all that his creatures that. He is well acquainted with with that with with what his creatures do. He knows what is in the land and the sea. Not a leaf falls, but he knows it. Not a grain in the deepest darkness of the earth, nor a thing green or dry, except that it is in a record or it is recorded in a clear book. He is capable of everything. To him belongs the kingdom of the heavens and the earth. He has power over everybody and everything. Everybody and everything is in need of him. He can do whatever he likes easily. And he's in no need of anything. L let me ask you this question. These last few uh, lines. What's the thamara? What's the fruit of this knowledge? He has power over everybody and everything. Everybody and everything is in need of him. And he can do whatever he likes easily. And he is in no need of anything. What is the fruit of that? For the believer to know that. Huh, Omar? Okay, yeah, but what effect does that have on you? What's the fruit? What's the benefit that you get from knowing those things? Iman. Okay, you're going to get Iman, but what kind of Iman? Something specific. He has power over everybody and everything. Everybody and everything is in need of him, and he can do whatever he likes easily, and he is in no need of anything. Is it humility? Huh? Humility. So if humility, that's not bad. Humble. But let's say, let's say, okay, when people need things, generally speaking, in this world, when they need things, what do they do? They ask. They beg. They, they ask. No, they beg. Source. They compromise. Don't they do that? They, they compromise. They, so for example, a person, he wants a new car. Okay? Or he wants his son to get accepted into this university. Or he wants to get this job. And sometimes what happens is that we think that person X or means Y is going to make this happen. Okay? Don't, doesn't that happen? Yeah. It happens. And some, yeah, and some <laughs> people start to do what? They start to uh, maybe bend the truth, make compromises, and do these things to what? Achieve their objectives. And they will um, beg so-and-so, lie to so-and-so, steal from so-and-so, to give to so-and-so, thinking that that's going to make whatever their dreams are come true or make them achieve their objective. <coughs> and they forget that ultimately it lies in whose hands? Allah. Allah's hands. And He is capable of making anything we want to happen, happen. In spite of what? In spite of so-and-so and so-and-so. So -and -so. Even if so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so don't want it to happen. So if we have this in our mind all the time, we have these lines in our mind all the time, when we want something, we'll turn to who? Allah. Allah. We won't turn to what? His creatures. But what happens is that we tend to sometimes forget this, and we start to what? Turn to the creatures instead of Allah. And we actually believe... or. We behave, inshallah, we don't believe that. We'll be, we'll, we'll, but we behave as if we believe that we're going to make something happen in spite of Allah. Right? Allah doesn't want it to happen, but I'm going to make it happen. No, if Allah doesn't want it to happen, it's not going to happen. So if we want it to happen, we should turn to who? To Allah. Wa alaykum as Alright, so then it says... No vision can grasp him, but he grasps all vision. What that means is no vision can encompass him, right? No vision can encompass him, but he encompasses all vision. And then they give some ayat, 
which drive some of these points home that they mention. So, for example, they mention Allah Khalqu wal Amr. Surely His is the creation and the commandment. And the statement of Allah, Huwa alladhi khalaqa lakum ma fil ardi jami'an. He it is who created for you all that is on the earth. In Allah huwa razzaq dhu quwwat al fatin. Verily, Allah is the all provider. He provides for everyone, owner of power, the most strong. So those two, so thus far, they've given us two sections. Relates to the belief in Allah, addressing two of the components. The first component was the lordship of Allah, actions which are specific to Him, only He performs. The second one was names by which He's called attributes with which he's described. So now they're going to bring another section. What do you think they're going to deal with in this section? Worship Allah. Right. His right to be worshipped alone. So it says, Allah is the only true God who alone deserves to be worshipped. He created the humans and the jinn just for this reason. For the purpose of what? Of worshipping him. That's our primary duty on this earth. And so what that means is that that should have paramount importance in our life. That worshipping Allah shouldn't be what? Second in priority. It should always be what? Uh-huh. First in priority. Anybody or anything worshipped besides Him is nothing but falsehood. All acts of worship, be it fasting, praying, sacrificing, vowing, or otherwise, should be directed to Him alone. Allah says, وَمَن يَدُعُ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخر. And whoever invokes or worships besides Allah any other God or of whom he has no proof, then his reckoning is only with his Lord. Surely the disbelievers will not be successful. So basically Allah is saying that the people who commit shirk will not be successful and they are disbelievers. Then it says, all the messengers of Allah called to the worship of Allah alone. And they mention the ayah. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا مِنْ قَبْلِكَ مِنْ رَسُولٍ إِلَّا نُوحِي إِلَيْهِ أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَعْبُدُونَ And we did not, O Muhammad, send any messenger before you, but we revealed to him, saying, None has the right to be worshipped but I, so worship me alone. So, this is... Um, the basis or this is the support for this last component that Allah's right to be worshipped alone. Then it says, a Muslim must direct all acts of worship to Allah alone. It is worth mentioning here that this worship must be offered in accordance with the teachings of Allah and His Messenger Muhammad. Let me make a few comments here. First of all, it says a Muslim must direct all acts of worship to Allah alone. So what that means is that everything that constitutes worship should be directed to Allah alone. Now, worship is not just a list of five or six or seven acts. But worship is everything that Allah loves and is pleased with. From statements and actions, whether they be statements and actions which are hidden or statements and actions which are apparent. So that includes... Actions of the heart. Like what? Like fear. So fear in the absolute and complete sense should only be directed to who? Allah. Because that's an act of worship. Allah says, وَلَا تَخَافُوهُمْ وَخَافُونِ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ He says, don't fear them, but fear me, if you truly believe. Another one is love. Love in the absolute sense, is an act of worship and should only be directed to who? Allah. So basically, loving in the absolute complete sense, loving something for itself completely, totally, that's something that only should be directed to who? Allah. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, He says, وَمِنُ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ He says, and from the people are those who they take others besides Allah or they take partners or rivals that they set up with Allah that they love the way they should only love Allah. But the people who truly believe they love Allah more than anything 
else. So we have to understand that worship is not just prayer, but worship is also what? Hmm? That surah is uh, it's Al Baqarah, the second surah, and the ayah number. I have to dig it up for you. I have to get it out for you. But uh, but it's in Surah Al Baqarah. You're welcome. All right. So worship is not just what prayer and fasting, but it's what it's everything Allah loves and is pleased with, and it even includes what certain actions of the heart, certain emotions like fear and love, absolute hope, absolute reliance. All those belong to who? Allah alone. Subhanallah, Shakir. Yeah, inshallah, they might have some uh, in the office. If they don't, we can get you one. Okay. We'll have to order you. Okay. Uh, Tafadali, Shaykh, yeah. Could you explain, um, just like over the country here recently, and I don't know what to do, but it seems like this brother's a new shahada. He goes to work, mm -hmm. and he has this fear and love of Allah. Will you tell him to go against the administration as to making his salat there? Mm -hmm. Or should he perform his job and make his salat later on if he loves Allah? Well, um, it, hopefully there will be no contradiction between fulfilling his obligation to his employer and fulfilling his obligation to his Lord in the sense that the employer is going to give him a break or two breaks every eight hours, two 15-minute breaks is going to give him at least a half an hour lunch and an hour lunch. So basically what he should do is just utilize the time that's allotted to what? To perform the prayers. Yeah, to perform the prayers. So as long as um, they give him a break, and they should, unless they want to violate um, the labor laws, then he just should perform the prayer at those times. Yeah, but it's not like, for example, let's say he worked on the assembly line, right? Right. <laughs> and the minute Salat al-Dhuhr comes in, he just walks away from his yeah. his post. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing exactly backs up and it you know, cre creates a, a lot of um, you know damage and you know backs up the whole system because he just decided to walk off. No, that's not how he, that's how he operates. But they're going to have a break at some point. They're going to stop the line. And they're going to give them a 15-minute break or however long. And at that time, that's when he would walk. He would pray. Yeah. All right. Tayyip. Um, then, it, the, the, the Kapal, as they say, it is worth mentioning here that this worship must be offered in accordance with the teachings of Allah and His Messenger Muhammad. So now what they do, what the Kapalas do, is they point to something very important. And that is the two pillars of worship. That worship has two pillars upon which it stands. And if those pillars are not there, the worship will not what? It will not stand. It will come falling down and it won't be acceptable. Is what that basically means. So what are these two pillars of worship? What are the two pillars of worship? First of all, they say that it is worth mentioning here that this worship must be offered. I'm sorry, first they say must direct all acts of worship to Allah alone. So that's the first pillar, which is what? Ikhlas, sincerity. So every act of worship we do, we have to do it sincerely for whose sake? Allah's sake. And as soon as we offer an act of worship for the sake of someone else, for the sake of some created being. So for example, a person, he has some friends who are Muslims, and um, they're very good Muslims. They're very good Muslims. They're very observant and committed. So when he's with them, he wants to impress them. He wants them to think highly of him. So when he's with them, he tends to what? Do things that will make them think, oh, you're, you're, you're pious like us too, you're committed like us too. So when he's with them, he'll start making dhikr. Subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. And he'll make it loud enough so they'll what? They'll hear and say, mashallah. Look at him, he's, he's making dhikr. Or they come to the masjid and he what? He'll start praying, but he just won't pray like rak'atin to greet the masjid. He'll what? Pray one prayer after another prayer after another prayer. So they'll say, oh, look how, look how committed he is to prayer. Look how much he wants to pray. Look how many prayers, prayers he's offering. al muhim right now, he's not worshipping to what? Allah. To please Allah. He's worshipping to please, please. to impress please. Friends. His friends. You got it? So that's not that's a lack of what? Sincerity. Mm -hmm. That his intention is not pure. It's corrupted with what? This desire to show off and to impress his friends. 
And that does what? It makes the worship what? Null and void. Null and void. As the Prophet said in the hadith of Abi Hurairah, in which he said that Allah says, Man amila amalan ashraka fihi ma'ya ghayri taraktuhu wa shirka. He says, whoever does a religious act and associates with me in that act, a partner, I will abandon him and his association. Meaning I won't accept that what? That act of worship that contains association. So that's the first pillar. We have to do it purely for Allah's sake, sincerely for Allah's sake. The second pillar comes in the statement where they said, must be offered in accordance with the teachings of Allah and his messenger Muhammad, which means that whatever act of worship we do, we have to have what? Proof. We have to have evidence that Allah and his messenger have actually, have actually legislated or prescribed that act of worship. Otherwise, it won't be accepted. As the Prophet said in the hadith of Aisha, collected by Muslim, Man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fa huwa rad. He said, whoever does a deed, which we, meaning he and Allah have not legislated, or he or Allah have not legislated, it will be what? Rejected. So for example, let's say a person, he offers a prayer at sunrise. And what I mean by sunrise is a shuruq. You guys know what I mean by shuruq, right? So basically, you know, you have the dawn, where the sun gets close to the horizon and the light of it starts to what? Starts to appear. Like a white line appears just above the horizon and you know what? The sun is about to what? Rise. So that's what? That's what we call Fajr. Right? The dawn. So then the sun rises, right? And when it gets above the horizon, they call that Shuruq. Right? When it gets above the horizon, they call it what? Shuruq. Now there's no prayer at this time. There's no prayer at the time of what? Shuruq. But this person does what? He says, I'm going to make a prayer at this time. Because it's a time what? where the sun appears and it, that shows the power of Allah. So I'm going to what? I'm going to pray at this time. So he prays at this time every day religiously. Seeking a special reward for praying at this time. What has he just done? He's right. right he's innovated. An act of worship, right? He's created another prayer that he what? He observes like an obligatory prayer. So when you do that in the deen, that won't be what? It won't be accepted. Even though you're trying to do something good. So we have to be very careful. Uh, huh? No, as long as he does, if he did it for Allah's sake, it wouldn't be anything more than just what? A bid'ah. If he did it for Allah's sake, it would just be a bid'ah. But it wouldn't be accepted. Yeah, now if he did it to the sun, <laughs> that would be a different story. So basically, the acts that we do, they have to be in accordance with what? With the teachings of the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay? So anything you do, and that's we have to be careful. Because many people, they do things, and they do them with a good intention, but there's no basis for it, and so they don't get rewarded for it. In fact, you can get what? You can earn Allah's anger. You can be punished for that. Okay? You can be punished for what? For inventing things in the deen, which what? Which have no basis. Um, I'll give you an example. People read the Quran, and when they finish reading the Quran, what do they say? Sadaqallahu al Azim. People do that all the time, right? They do that all the time. They say Sadaqallahu al Azim. And that's true. Sadaqallahu al Azim, Allah has spoken the truth. That's 100% true. They're not saying something which is a lie. But if they do it following the Qur'an, believing that what? This is what you're supposed to do and you get a reward for doing that, then they've, they've just done what? They've innovated. Okay? And so not only are they not going to get it accepted what they're doing, but they may even what? Get in trouble with Allah, displease Allah, anger Allah for what? Inventing this religion. Because you have to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he talked about this deen, when he described it in the Qur'an, he described it as what? As perfect. Right? He described this deen as perfect. So think about this, and there's a lot of people people who do this, they don't think about it in this way. That's why we have to think. We have to really critically analyze what we're doing. If you invent something new into the deen, you introduce something new into the deen, in effect, you're saying that the deen is not 
Perfect. Because if it were perfect, you wouldn't need to do what? You would need to edit it. You would need to modify it. You would need to add to it or delete from it, right? So in effect, you're saying that the deen is not perfect. So you're, it's as if you're calling Allah a liar. You guys see that? That See how serious that is? And a lot of people don't think of it like that. Another th way to look at it is that who did Allah send with the deen? Send the Prophet Muhammad sallam, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talk, talk about the Prophet as being someone who what? Who gave everything that was given to him. He didn't hold back. Okay? So he said in the, in, in the Quran, uh, he said, وَمَا هُوَ عَلَى الْغَيْبِ بِظَنِيمٍ and he, regarding the unseen, regarding the wahi, regarding the information that's been given to him, is not what? Is not banin. He's not bakhil. He's not someone who's what? Stingy or miserly. Meaning he gives some, but what? Withhold some. No, he gives what? He gives generously. Whatever Allah gives him, he what? He gives to you. That's how Allah describes him in the Quran. But if you say, if you add something to the deen, and you say, this is from the deen. This is how it should be. When people read the Quran, they should finish it and say, Sadaqallah al You add that. It's as if you're saying about the Prophet that he didn't what? He didn't tell the whole story. He kept this one for himself, so we had to what? We had to add it. We had to bring it. You guys see that? So when you. Huh, exactly. So, or calling him that he didn't do his job, basically. So calling Allah a liar and saying the Prophet what? Fell short and didn't do his job. So this is the. the this, we have to understand how severe this can be. This act, this act of what? Adding things to the deen. So two pillars of worship. When we worship Allah, we're going to do something and we expect to get rewarded for it. We need to be sure we do it for Allah's sake. And we need to be sure that whatever we do, we have what? Proof and evidence that Allah has what? Legislated it or the Prophet has what? Prescribed it. Alright, so it goes on. Next uh, paragraph it says, Allah sent the Prophet وسلم, with the Quran. To call all mankind to the religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is the same religion given to Adam, the first man and the first prophet of Allah, and it was the religion of all the prophets sent by Allah to mankind. Islam is perfect and complete, and anyone who desires a religion other than Islam, Allah will never accept it from him. Here, they point to something which is important. And what they point to... Oh, actually, let me do one other thing before we go on. Let's go back to what we were just talking about, the two pillars of worship. There's an important note. There's an important note um, related to what we just said about the two pillars of worship. We said two pillars of worship were sincerity and following, basically. Sincerity, doing it for Allah's sake. Following, doing it the way the Prophet prescribed or Allah prescribed. There's a, a message or a lesson that we learn from here, a qaid that we can take from this. And that is that al-asl fil ibadat al-hurmatu wal hadar That when it comes to acts of worship, and this is important too, when it comes to acts of worship, the original rule is that they are prohibited. They are illegal. The original rule is that they're illegal. What does that mean? That means if you do an act of worship, you have to have permission. You have to have permission before you can do it. So you need to ask yourself, okay, I'm going to do this act of worship. Where's my permission? Where's my license? Whenever it comes to acts of worship, the usul, the original rules are what? Prohibited. This is important because when people get into discussions about bid'ah, when they get into discussions about innovations, someone will, inadver in invariably they'll say, what's the proof? Meaning, and I'll give you an example what I mean by that. We have a person who they say, Sadaqallahu al -Azim. Okay? After they read the Quran, they say, Sadaqallahu al -Azim. And you say, Ya khi, you're not supposed to say that, that's a bid'ah. You say, you're not supposed to say that, that's an innovation. And he'll say, What's the proof it's an innovation? He'll say, What's the proof? Show me the proof that it's innovation. Is that question correct? No. Is that question correct? No. Because we said what? The original rule is that acts of worship are prohibited. So if I say it's bid'ah, I'm not the one who has to what? To prove it. I don't have to prove 
that you can't do it. You have to prove that you can do it. So it's wrong for someone to say, when they're told, you're not supposed to do this, there's no proof for this. They say, what's the proof that there's no proof? <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Because anytime I'm going to do any act of worship, I have to have permission. So the person who tell, prohibits me doesn't have to prove it's prohibited, because it's an act of worship. The asal, the original rule is what? Prohibited. The one who does it has to prove that it's permitted. You guys understand that? So pay attention to that. It's an important uh, note that I wanted to point out. that Because that happens all the time. You'll say, for example, people celebrate the Prophet's birthday. And they celebrate like it's what? It's like it's, like it's an act of worship, something they're going to get rewarded for. Mm -hmm. They have all these justifications for it. And when people say, Ahi, this practice is not legislated, it's not prescribed. It's not proper for Muslims to do this. They'll say, what's the proof? Prove to me that it's what? It's not correct. It's not allowed. So no, that's wrong. You have to what? You have to prove that it's allowed. Because the asl, the original rule when it comes to ibadat, is al-hurmatu wal hadar That they are what? Prohibited and what? And not allowed. They're impermissible. You can't do it unless what? You have permission. So if you want to do something, you have to prove that it's what? It's legislated or prescribed. Alright, with that said now, we go to this section where they talked about Islam. And if you notice, they talk about how Allah sent the Prophet with Islam. Then they say Islam is the same religion given to Adam and the religion of all the Prophets. So what this teaches you is that Islam has two what? It has two meanings or two connotations. The first one, Islam bi ma'nahu al-am. Islam with its what? Its general meaning. Islam has what? A general meaning. And the general meaning of Islam is what? Deen al-Anbiya or Deen al-Jami al-Anbiya or Rusul. Wa asluhu al-Tawheed which they have shirk. So the, the original meaning or the general meaning of Islam is the religion of all the, all the prophets. It's the religion of all the prophets, all the messengers, and the core of it, the crux of it, the cornerstone of it is Tawheed, monotheism, and avoiding what? Avoiding idolatry and polytheism, a shirk. So that's what? That's Islam with the general meaning. The second one is Islam bi ma'nahul khas. Islam with its what? Its specific meaning. And that's the religion that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, <coughs> came with. That's the religion of the Prophet Muhammad. <laughs> wa alaykum <laughs> salam wa rahmatullah. <laughs> That's the religion the Prophet Muhammad came with. So you have two meanings for Islam. Two meanings for Islam. The first one, the religion of all the prophets, all the messengers, and its crux, or its cornerstone, its root, its foundation, its tawheed, and avoiding idolatry or polytheism. And the second meaning is Islam, bi ma'nahu al-khas, Islam with a specific meaning, which is the religion of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, came with. All right, now, I'm going to give you an ayah, and you tell me which Islam is being referred to. Again, Islam with a general meaning is what? Islam of what? All the prophets, the religion from the beginning of time to the end of time that Allah will accept, and its root or core or cornerstone is monotheism and avoiding idolatry. All right, so Allah says in Surah Al-Imran, verse 19, He says, Inna dina in the lahi Islam. Al Islam. Inna dina in the lahi Islam. Bidun al Is it al? Is it al? Ajib. Inna dina in the lahi Al Islam. Inna dina in the lahi Al Islam. Sorry, it's al. Al Islam. Sorry. Alright, so what do you guys think? You can't answer. You can't answer. Shh. Alright, so what do you guys think? Inna dina in the lahi Al Islam. The religion. Hmm? The religion with Allah. Is Islam? Which one? General or specific? General. general. Let me see hands for general. <laughs> the religion with Allah is Islam. Or as far as Allah is concerned, okay, is Islam. Let me see hands for general. Sah is general. General. That means what? The religion of all the prophets, the religion that Allah accepts from what? Beginning of time and end of time is what? 
Islam. So let's talk about the general Islam. Move to that. Mm-hmm. Let me give you another one. Not yet. Not yet. I'm going to give that one yet. I'll give him another one. Okay, this one is from Al Ma'idah, verse 3. This one is from Al Ma'idah, verse 3. اليوم أكملت لكم دينكم وأتممت عليكم نعمتي ورضيت لكم الإسلام دينا. This day I have perfected your religion for you. Completed my favor upon you. And I am pleased with Islam as your religion. General or specific? Specific. specific. Talk about the deen of what? The Prophet. Because that was the, that was the day you completed what? The Islam of what? Of the Prophet Muhammad Mumtaz. And also put the seal. Eh. Isn't it, wasn't that the night of the Hmm? Wasn't that the night of the Mm-mm. That was later on. That was later on. <laughs> Alright, let me give you one more. That's the one that the Sheikh wanted to give. This one is 385. <laughs> Whoever desires a religion of an Islam, it will never be accepted from him. And he will be in the hereafter from the losers. Is that general or specific? General. Let me see hands for general. Let me see hands for general. Everybody general? I sent to him. It's general. Talking about what? From the beginning of time to the end of time, the only religion that Allah ever accepted and ever will accept is what? Islam. Mumtaz. Surrendering to him. All right, we'll stop there. Any questions? Any questions? Comments or complaints? Questions, comments, comments. I have a complaint. I have. That I, the four components, we drilled that last time. I and I said, I'm, I won't, if you weren't here, obviously, you, everybody, if you weren't here, you excuse. But there were people who were here. I'm not going to mention any names. They were here last week. And I said, and it's four components. And we drilled it. Four components. I didn't pick on you guys and mention some of the other more difficult things I could have mentioned and asked about. I just said four components of belief in Allah. Four things. <laughs> Existence, lordship, names and attributes, right to be worshipped alone. Four things. We drilled last week. Come this mo- come today. Hmm. And and uh, I think what the Sheikh is going to do, he's going to pull the plug. Because he's going to say, they're not learning. We could use this time more wisely. No more lessons. I think that's what's going to happen. I'm afraid that that might happen. If you guys keep coming and you don't know the information, you'll pull the plug and we'll have nothing. So let's not let that happen. Inshallah, we're going to pull the plug. We're going to pull the plug. Any other questions, comments, or complaints? Tell the Sheikh, you have one? Yeah. How was your trip? How was your weekend? Alhamdulillah, it was two questions. It was pretty good, to be honest with you. I went to to my old stomping grounds. I went to, or stomping grounds. I went to, uh, Michigan, uh, Detroit, Michigan, and uh, they had a a weekend seminar. The theme was uh, the Quran as a means for tasfi wa tarbiya, and it was very good. It was a very good seminar. Um, they seemed to really, really enjoy. that. a survey at the end, and the feedback was really positive. Uh, what we did uh, on Saturday, we um, we started out with talking about the the need, the need, the the Islamic Ummah's need for tasfiyah with tarbiya. So we talked about that, and we talked about what a tasfiyah with tarbiya is, and what are the different um, contaminants or the different sicknesses that are afflicting the Ummah that they need to use this tasfiyah tarbiya to what to purify themselves of. So we talked about that, and we talked about what Tasfiyah Tarbiyah means, and how we can, and how, um, the tools, the different tools or means. And the one mean that we wanted to talk about specifically was what? The Qur'an. So then we went from there to talk about how the Qur'an can be used as a means for Tasfiyah, what Tarbiyah. So we talked about that. Um, and then after that, um, we did a practical exercise of how to read the Qur'an, Seeking what? A tasfiya. Seeking to use the Quran to what? To purify you. How you have to read the Quran. How do you approach it? How do you read it? So we gave them like a practical exercise on that. So I kind of walked them through that. So then the next day we had two workshops. The first workshop was uh, a tajweed workshop. 
where we um, we kind of did like um, we kind of did first we talked about difficult letters and how to pronounce them Makarij, um the points of pronunciation then we talked about some of the rules we picked one surah took the rules out first went over those rules and then after that we did kind of like read correct we did that they really enjoyed that and then the final thing we did was we did a practical workshop where they had to do what we had done the day before. So I would give them a uh, few ayat from the Qur'an, and they had to basically practice what we did the day before. How do you read the Qur'an seeking what? Tasfiyah. Like that. And so that's what we did over the weekend, Yashir. Alhamdulillah, was pretty good. I hope you enjoyed it too. Alhamdulillah, was pretty good. I, enjoyed, I did actually. I did. Welcome back. Allah is actually Did anybody make you tea too? No, nobody makes tea like you. That's why I couldn't wait to get back. Thank you, Shay. Any other questions, comments, complaints, critiques? Inshallah, for those who will answer the questions for uh, uh, the shake. <laughs> shake. Shake. Uh, Milkshake. We'll get, we'll get a free copy of the, the book. MashaAllah. Yeah. Look at the incentive. So Look at the incentive. Instead of pulling the blood, they understand we're going to give it something. Fine, if there are no questions going so on. So we'd like to get a free book. Inshallah, make sure that you go over the points and you should be prepared with some questions to you, Inshallah. Inshallah, I'll definitely do that. It's a good question to you, so you could not get the book. That's <laughs> some hard questions. Fine, hmm. either we'll close and we'll see you guys. Uh, Tomorrow for the Tarbiyah class, obviously, and then next week. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa barak. Muhammad.